So my name is Alex Matchner. I'm here to talk about architecting real-time mobile apps. And uh, I live and work out of New York, and I'm a developer at a company called Future Proof Retail, which focuses on building lots of mobile apps that are sort of retail-centric. And I used to be a member of the Ember.js core team, still very actively involved in the community, mostly now as a maintainer of an add-on called Ember Concurrency. Um, I want to try something. I'm not sure if it's a good idea, but just a show of hands, who here uses Ember? OK, let the record show that everybody's raising their hands. And everyone, of course, probably uses Ember concurrency. But moving on. So the main app that I maintain is an app called Mobile Checkout. And it's pretty simple. It's a mobile app. You can get it on the App Store or Play Store, and you can use it to go into supporting stores, scan items with your phone, pay on your phone, and check out and skip the line. And we, it's a white-labeled app that's kind of available in a variety of different brands. Um, the one that's closest to here would be in Belgium, where we're live at uh, Spar and OK stores for the Scan Pay Go app. And we build this with Ember and Cordova. So unlike probably a lot of people here, it's not React Native, but it's something that's kind of been around since before React Native. So as a quick demo of what the experience is like, you use the app, you open it, you geolocate, it finds the nearest store, you say you want to start shopping, you can start pulling items off the shelf, you can scan them with your phone, you see the items with real prices show up at the bottom, you review what you've added to your cart, and then you check out. This is a quick demo of me using the app to scan some Haribo gummy bears from the Fairway store in New York and then getting to the checkout screen. So that's, that's all running Ember inside a Cordova app. And we're kind of live at a bunch of different places around the globe. These are just the ones that are sort of the larger retailers. We also have sort of um, vending machine deployments and micro markets that we also built for. So this is supposed to be a talk on real-time architecture. So exactly where, where's the real time in an, in an app like this? I mean, you can sort of tell from the demos that you're scanning codes, and there's got to be some interaction with the server. But maybe you, know, maybe you could just do that with Ajax. Maybe you're just saying, like, hey, server, uh, look up this item, add it to the cart, and, and give me the result. So where's the, where's the real time aspect of an app like this? Well, part of it is that there's another app that's not one that you get from the app store, but it's the one that the cashiers and merchants have in the store. And one of the main functionalities of this app is to um, summarize all the people that are currently in your store shopping, and you can sort of see like, kind of where they are in the process, what they've added to their cart. But more importantly, there's also this occasional security check. So part of our security model is that you know, most of the time, you can just walk out of the store and skip the line. And, but every so often, there might be some logic that triggers, like, hey, this, it's, it's time for uh, a cashier to come and sort of just double check what you've scanned. And so there's this kind of interaction, this interplay uh, between the server that needs to keep the, the shopper app and the merchant app in sync. And this kind of interplay might remind you of another much more common app that you certainly heard of. So the various rideshare apps, such as Uber and Lyft, have this kind of interaction where you've got shoppers, um, you, I'm sorry, passengers using the passenger app that you can just get from the app store, and then drivers are also connecting as well. And so these apps, in order for the whole product to work, need to be very reliably real-time. And for us, if, you, if there's anything where the shopper and the merchant app are out of sync, then you're going to have a very awkward checkout experience. So it's very important for our product that these things just work very seamlessly. So yes, it's very business critical that everything is in sync with the server, because if they're in sync with the server, they're in sync with each other. So, of all the things that we have to build as part of this product to make it work, all the integrations, all of the linking up with super old inventory infrastructure so that we can look up items and prices and all this stuff, I consider what we have to do in the mobile apps to keep things in sync and build that correctly to be probably the most difficult aspect of, of what we do. And it's deceptively difficult. It doesn't sound like it would be, but it eats up a lot of time. And, and, and I think we've found some good patterns for it now, but it's, it's taken quite a while. And I found that for this particular kind of app, there's not a lot of good like, reference and blogs and people talking about it, because it's, it's, it's kind of special in, in ways that I'll describe um, that are common with like, the Uber rideshare apps. But I'll get into that in a moment. But let's first uh, define some basic terms. So when I say real-time, uh, what does that actually mean? And so 
In very general terms, I just mean any situation where you have a client app that says, hey server, please subscribe me to like this kind of event or this piece of data that changes over time. And then after that point, it's all up to the server to listen on its end for any changes and then broadcast those to anybody who is subscribed to it. So I would contrast this with, very, with the classic sort of request response cycle of, of an app where you tap a button to refresh, get the latest data, and that'll kick off an AJAX request. And, and after that's done, there's no further interaction from the server. So with real time, it's any kind of inter, inter, interaction where the server is alive and continuing to send data. So in our app, the subscriptions in place are mostly along the lines of the shopper app saying, hey server, I, I would like to start shopping at the store. Please notify me of any like changes to my shopping session, such as if, uh, you know, if the merchant does something or cancels the purchase or approves the purchase during the security check. And for the merchant app that lives in the store, there's sort of an even like wider scope subscription of uh, please let me know of any changes, new purchases and purchases that are, that are needing a security check. Let me know of anything that happens at this particular store that um, I'm supervising, that I'm logged into. So real time is a giant broad topic and I realized sort of after submitting uh, this talk that I would need to focus on something narrower. And a lot could be said about exactly how you should architect the server side of things because it's very difficult if you're going to do it right, particularly for this kind of app. But for this talk, I'm going to focus on the client. And I, I do have a QA session that's, uh, that's scheduled for tomorrow. So um, if you've got any questions for what I'd recommend on the server side, happy to answer those. But uh, this talk will just be um, sort of on the client side architectural patterns. So a lot to be said about the server, but it would be out of scope and would have to be in a separate talk. So part of it being difficult to find the literature I need to sort of compare how our approach is to other things is that um, I think everyone has a different idea of what real time means. And I think maybe being able to qualify these things and introducing some terminology might help people place where they are on that sort of difficulty scale as they're maybe planning out features that they want to add to their apps or make their apps more real time. So uh, I don't stand by these names, but they're good enough. So I'd say the first degree of real time is so-called nice to have real time. And a very standard example of this would be getting rid of a refresh button. So chances are you, you could say you've already, you already have an app that's working. It's largely request response based and uh, product project manager comes along and says like, it's pretty annoying that we still you know, it's 2018 and you still have to press that refresh button to get the latest data. Uh, let's fix that. How do we go about doing that? And that's an example of sort of nice to have real time where it's not completely critical to your product, but it could be sort of like bolted on to your existing system or introduced in a way that doesn't involve like rebuilding everything from the ground up. So a common approach and one that we used at one point is you have something like Rails, which uh, certainly five years ago didn't have tons of, it didn't have action cable, it didn't have sort of WebSocket support. So it was very common to use a system like Pusher so that you didn't have to teach Rails how to maintain a persistent connection to the client. You let Pusher do that, you tell your clients to connect to Pusher, and then all Rails has to do is tell Pusher that stuff changed. Um, so that's kind of an example of the sort of nice to have real time, which the pattern is. The server needs to add some code to start broadcasting events. The client needs to start um, subscribing to specific event names. And then the easiest thing that you can do, depending, depending on what data that you can sort of fit into that payload that needs to be sent out to everybody, um, you may or may not on the client need to just like hit that same endpoint that you used to hit when you tap the refresh button. Um, sometimes that, that notification, that data change payload is so custom tailored to a specific client that you can't share that with everybody, but I'm starting to get into stuff that's on the sort of server side stuff. But so this is all sort of within the like the easiest degree of making things more real time in your app. So the second one, which is also a name I'm not, not sure I'm in love with, but it's basically if you have, I call it single page real time, which is basically you are using a much more refined and robust server side mechanism for publishing and maintaining um, synchronicity with all of your connected clients. But on the client side, 
the data that the server is sending you is decoupled from any kind of client-side navigation. Um, so for instance, you could think of a, a having an, a, an admin dashboard where one page or maybe even one component opens a connection to some server and starts getting live st statistics coming into it and progressively updating some graph that shifts over over time. Um, that definitely involves some real uh, like server backend might, but it's you're never going to get an event sent to that component that causes the screen that you're on to actually shift. You're not going to, it's not going to make you navigate away. And in this way, this is a very like self-contained real time that is constrained in that way to, so as to not get very, so as to not be very difficult to, to write because everything is contained in this little world or component where you get a sort of view into some real time piece of data. So robust server-side subscription management, all these things that are difficult to do, but largely constrained to a single page or a single component. And the messages that you get from the server are only pretty much going to amount to re-rendering that view, that component, that page that you're on, but never sort of deeply integrate with the state of your app and what, what you're currently navigating and looking at. So to express things in sort of meme terminology, you start off with having uh, no real time. You just have a refresh button in your product. You have nice to have real time, so you've added Pusher to your Rails app. And then you have single page real time, which is a robust subscription mechanism, but all constrained in a single client side component. So what's the third one? Well, I guess I'd call it deep real time. And I would say that this is, this is where you start to get into the realm of like Uber and sort of the realm of the problems that I've had to solve for for my app. And that's when, that's when the data that the server can send you has implications on like where you are in the app, like what you're currently looking at, which page you're on. And when you start getting into that particular problem set, you, it, you realize you're in a completely different territory and a lot of the tools that you might normally reach for suddenly break in weird ways and don't really seem to fit this mental model. So in other words, now the server can start sending you things that say, uh, you can't look at this page anymore, you need to be here. And you need to write your client code in such a way that uh, you can trust it to always do the right thing, but ultimately leave uh, the server um, in charge of, of what the state's going to be. So thinking about back to the Uber use case, uh, the, the interaction basically starts with the passenger is going to submit a request to, like, I would I'd like to ride from here to here. And the server is going to start looking for a driver and eventually find a driver that's going to pick up the passenger and take them to their destination. And it's internally going to set this passenger session state to, let's say, riding. I don't work at, I don't work at Uber. I don't know how this stuff all works internally, but it's the same basic mechanisms. So the client app that they've written is going to see this new riding state that's been broadcast to it from some live connection, presumably some kind of socket. And it's going to be smart enough to be like, well, I was on the request ride screen, but this doesn't make sense for me to be here anymore. Now I need to be in the sort of current ride screen. Again, if this is sounding easy, just wait. It's not. Um, and we'll, we'll get to that. But uh, so one of the things that's sort of built into the app is, is this idea that uh, there's no way to like navigate back to a state that doesn't, there's no, long, there's no way to navigate back to a screen that you, that doesn't logically make sense for you to be able to look at. There's all these kind of impossible states that the app prevents you from being in as part of, of this solution. And that's sort of a way to, to think about it. There's all these, you, you want to make impossible states impossible. And then now bringing in the real time aspect of it is, is sort of the difficult part. So that was Uber. Our app is very similar in that um, when the shopper is basically, if, Whenever there's an exchange that takes place where it's like kind of a handoff between the, the shopper and the merchant, um, we have these similar problems. So if, if our security algorithm kicks in and says, uh, you've had you know, so many purchases where you weren't bag checked and you're buying all sorts of weird items uh, or whatever it is, I can't you know, give away the, the company secrets on how all this stuff works. But if we decide that you need a bag check, then you're going to be put in a special state. You as a client are going to get that message from the server. The merchant app is going to get a message saying, you know, alerting and making, uh, we, we sort of have this hardware beacon that flashes and makes noise to alert people that uh, sort of a manual intervention is needed. And um, 
So the employee is going to see this merchant app that's now beeping and making noise and flashing. And they're going to do the bag check, make sure all the items are there and everything is as what you expect. And then they approve the purchase, and then that's going, to broad, that's going to set the state of the purchase to complete, which gets broadcasted to everyone that's subscribed to it. And the shopper app needs to be smart enough to go to the receipt screen. Again, just reading this stuff out loud sounds easy, but it's not. So it's very difficult to actually get this stuff right, and I've spent a long time trying a bunch of different patterns that never uh, quite fit. And I'd, I'd always try to also, like, you know, I, I work on mostly React, but I also keep uh, a pulse on, on what all... The, I'm sorry, I think I said that wrong. I mostly work on Ember, uh, but I keep a pulse on whatever, what's going on in the React community and see if maybe, maybe Redux fits in here, maybe MobX, maybe some other thing. So I tried a lot of things, and I think, uh, I think I'm a lot closer to, to something, which is what I'm presenting on. So what I found is that having worked on Ember and having built lots of apps that were typically facing like standard desktop browser, um, a lot of my go-to tools for how do I build this, how do I use promises, how do I write this click handler, how do I change the state of the app, how do I transition between screens, uh, a, a lot of these tools in my toolkit started to just not make sense when I had to deal with, with mobile. Uh, and you'd think that there'd be more commonality, but all these, these little ways where the assumptions were just slightly different uh, were constantly trolling me. And, um, and I think there's one anti-pattern in particular, which is hard to, <laughs> like so many other things, it's so hard to put a name to, but I would call this pattern, um, which you might find in lots of sort of intro tutorials for how to build web apps, the, the break the app and fix it approach. So uh, you, this is kind of pseudo code that's a mixture of how things look in Ember and, and React and whatever your favorite sort of uh, component or framework library, whatever you want to call it. Um, th this is an example of something you might see on a, a sort of an intro page. How do I do X? How do I do Y? And this would be, how do I implement the login button on this page? So assuming the user has already filled out their username and other information and they tap login, you take this data and then you hit the server with it, you await the promise that comes back from hitting the server, and if the response is a success, then you, there's kind of this two-phase process of like update the state but then transition to where I should, should go. But this is kind of like a two-phase, like dual right approach. And I, I consider it sort of breaking the app and fixing it because it's like at this point, whether you model this as like a Redux dispatched event or some other way of observing state changes or mutating some shared state, if this were the only thing that would happen, then you've left the app in a state that doesn't make sense, specifically because why would you ever be continuing to display a login page if uh, your app knows that a user is logged in. So we'll, we'll get to what this is looking like, but this is the part that's kind of suspect. Why do I need to write this part? We know that obviously we need to publish some state change, but why do we need to do the second step? And isn't it a little weird that we're kind of, even, the, even if this synchronously happens right after, some, something's a little off here. And I think particularly if you're used to building you know, React web apps, Ember web apps, you've got sort of an idea for what encapsulation means. Um, so for instance, it's, it might be really tempting to lock away a certain piece of, of logic into a specific component because you think, okay, this is the login component. This knows how to log people in and should just know where to go after login success. Seems reasonable. But this is one of those places where if you're building real time, that's gonna come back and troll you because you can't predict what the server state is going to have. Like the server, if you happen to have a stream of, of authentication updates coming from the server, then the server at any point can say, uh, your session's timed out, you're no longer logged in, and stop displaying whatever screen that you're on. So the idea that one component would know what to do in that case of you know, no longer being logged in or logging in and suddenly having a session, it makes less and less sense when, when your server is ultimately uh, the thing in charge. So some of you are thinking, this sounds like kind of like a Redux-y thing, right? It sounds like maybe there's some global concern where you need to decide what to do, and you can funnel something through the top level that says, you know, logged in and, and decide where to go. I, I get the intuition, but um, certainly if you're, if you're saying that I should start putting all like the component local state in Redux, I'm not a fan of that. Um, there's plenty of people that have tons of opinions who can say that more eloquently than me. But more specific to this problem is that I looked around a lot, 
and I really couldn't find a Redux-centric library that solved all of the different mobile navigation uh, problems that, that need to be solved in order for me to sort of take it seriously. So naturally, I figured since my app's pretty much the same as Uber's as far as this interaction goes, I'd look to what they did. And so Uber uses this library that they open sourced sometime last year called RIBS, R-I-B, for routers, interactors, and builders. And a rib is basically any one of these nodes represents a rib. It's got some, uh, some stateful data to it and an optional view that it might render. And the idea is that you should try and structure yourself, structure your app into a, a tree of potential like branches and ribs such that, um, in, in this case, oh, let me let's actually let's lead by example. So this is an example where you start the app and you're on the sort of login screen and then the root node is basically going to be in charge of basically listening to an authentic, uh, an observable, like an RX observable that's broadcasting events every time that there's a change to user authentication. And they're going to log into this page. That's ultimately going to sort of do a flux style cyclical. Uh, it's going to cause an event to be fired on the, on the root. The root's going to capture that event. It's going to be like, oh, well, now the person's logged in. This whole like logged out node doesn't make sense to, this whole subtree doesn't make sense to exist anymore. So it detaches, cleans up after itself, and then installs a logged in tree in its place. So you can sort of get a sense for, there's something Redux-y happening here. There's sort of like, have the rootmost thing be concerned with, with how to handle these transitions. Um, so yeah, ribs give you this sort of like reactive tree architecture, and there's like a sort of clear, um, model of like which nodes in charge of what and in, and even though the example I gave before is sort of authentication being handled at the root there's all these sort of subtrees where they are only concerned with listening to changes to an observable that really belongs to them so it's not redux but it's reduxy and I mean ultimately ribs is is uh, it's not a JavaScript library it's actually a framework for um, that's implemented in both iOS and Android and the idea is that if you can if you can propose a new feature you want to build in terms of ribs, then you can hand that to your Android team and your iOS team, and, and they'll build the same things using Android or iOS, but they're both like building the same components that you've agreed to build, build ahead of time versus having to try and converge on the same designs with Android-specific UI and um, iOS-specific UI and components and stuff like that. Um, so this, there's not really an option of like, I'll just use ribs. It's mostly just an idea of like, what are we going to try and build and model this thing off of? So one thing I didn't really like about ribs is that there's still a lot of like manual checking and detaching of like trees. Like the root thing has to say, okay, you're no longer logged in. Is the logged out thing still attached? If, if it is, uh, remove it. And there's a lot of like kind of mutation on sort of really sensitive parts of, of um, your app state that I didn't, I didn't really like. You know, I'm used to doing things in Ember. Things are often more declarative than that. Uh, as they are in React. You don't ever have to say, like, I would like to unrender this. You just don't retent, return it from your render hook. Um, I shouldn't use a hook anymore. That means something else now. Um, so the other pattern is that ribs doesn't really come with a sort of community standard for how to build, like, really complicated navigational structures. It's just how do you model your app state. And when I actually use the, the Uber app, there's not tons of these, like, nested pushed states and modals and screens and stuff. A lot of it's kind of flat. And the flatter your app is, the kind of closer to that like um, second sort of real time. It, it just gets a little bit easier. There's less like, you know, multiple trees being at different depths that need to agree with each other. So we like these ribs, these RIBs, these router interactor builders, um, but we missed having models and components. So uh, so we built something called the MIC rib by Future Proof Retail, called the Model Component Router Interactor Builder. And just to be clear, this is a total joke. I had, I, had to go to, I had to go to Wiki and basically look up the McRib because I thought maybe this would just be like this American joke that wouldn't make sense. Because the McRib is a sandwich that comes and goes from McDonald's in a seasonal basis. And when it comes, everyone gets really excited about it when it leaves, everyone's sad. And I expected, maybe, maybe Europeans don't know about this, but it turns out the McRib is actually a like full-time year-round item in Germany. Complete surprise to me. All right, so... What's so difficult about all of these problems? And I'm gonna need to speed it up here. The answer is that there's all these different like competing ideas of trees. You've got your view layer, you've got your JSON data, 
these ribs as a way of structuring your app are also a form of trees. Your, your, your common sort of classic browser APIs for, for declaring all these different routes and URLs take the form of a tree. And all these different APIs sort of try to say, OK, I, I'll try to couple these trees to each other. Maybe you're like an ember. Um, for a long time, I and mean, it's more flexible now, but for a long time you sort of had a, an approach where like your, your URL tree is kind of coupled to the, the UI that we intend to render and how those things get nested. And it wasn't really doing me any favors when actually trying to build a mobile app. So um, yeah, all these browser-based API, APIs are usually coupling trees together to sort of simplify, simplify things for you, but if it's the wrong coupling, it doesn't do you any favors for mobile. So we need to talk about this tree. What is this tree? This is the browser navigation stack. It is the simplest tree. And by that, I mean it's uh, you know, this stack here that you can control with uh, backwards and forwards buttons. So it's a single branch tree that you can walk forward and back on. And any time that you're back along the stack and you push another frame, it kind, of, it kind of gets rid of the forward stack and then starts you off on a new branch. It's the simplest possible tree, and yet a few years ago, it was the most difficult kind of tree to, to build around. And you know, in 2013, it was very common for, the, for, the, for all the JavaScript frameworks to kind of give you a solution that had broken URLs or broken back buttons. And Ember, which is the thing that I worked on, was really good at sort of pushing that forward. But you know, fast forward, but you know, six years even before that, they had already introduced you know, the iPhone and these concept of pushing all these stacks to navigation controllers and all these things. And, and if, if you imagine looking at all the, all the different tabs of a very basic app, all these different tabs have their own sort of complicated states where things can be pushed to each other and those, those nodes can have subchildren and substacks. So with all these different trees, it's very important for the rules to be simple. And I'm going to try and speed it along a bit here. So I want to make a quick call out to a library that I think is very fantastically designed, and, and that's React Navigation. And that's something that you can use if you're building uh, uh, React Native apps. Quick show of hands, who's using React Navigation? OK, more people using that than Ember. That's fair. And um, I love this library. I mean, just as someone who wants to build his own, sort of bring some of this to, to Ember, I think they have a really powerful abstraction for a navigator um, where you can have stacks and you can have tabs. And you can have switch navigators when you're, you know, so, you, so that when you log out, you don't maintain state of all the logged in stuff. It's a very simple mental model, and it's very easy to like refactor and iterate and take something that was a simple screen and promote it. So I basically I want to build this uh, in Ember because I don't really have another option at this point. But there's one thing that's kind of missing from React Navigation, and that's the idea that you might have constraints that are driven by the current state of data. So React Navigation's mental model or how they tell you to use it is basically let React Navigation handle everything that has to do with navigation state. Don't try and touch that. Don't try to use Redux for that. They used to sort of let you use Redux no longer. Now they want you, now the only place that Redux comes in is if there's any kind of state that you might want to share with another one, you need to use like a Redux store and then start using higher order components. Like if you have a shared theme between all these things that you want to be able to change and have it update everywhere, then that's what you use. You use Redux. But what if that, that other state that you're supposed to put in Redux has implications on where you can navigate. Well, then you wind up with a situation where Redux sees something that needs to change, tells the navigator, but they, they kind of crisscross because they're kind of two different. Uh, I, there's a previous talk um, that said, like, you, you probably shouldn't try to mix two different state machine approaches. Um, you kind of want to pick one or the other. But when you start thinking about this sort of uh, real-time solution or these real-time problems, uh, you realize that the navigator and whatever you're tracking state in, um, they kind of need to be the same thing. So what we've been doing at FutureProof is working on an, uh, an add-on that is not released yet because it's kind of still enmeshed in one of our apps. Um, but it's kind of scoping out or staking our claim to something called Ember Navigator, which is really based on React Navigation because they've done such a good job, but with additional support for uh, live data constraints. So this thing that we need in order for us to actually build our app without a bunch of duplication and, and some ugly logic. So one thing that we have, this I guess isn't too important, but there is a separate state tree, um, separate from components. Uh, I'll just skip that slide. And this is an example of kind of what it looks like. This is a subset of our sort of like stack that we use that this is, this is the sort of section of the app where you're actually monitoring your active purchase. 
And the idea here is that you can just define these constraints that say, when the purchase state is this, you can go here, 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 and I'm running out of time here, but uh, the idea here is that when you're navigating from outside of, of this particular route into it, all you need to do is say, I'd like to track, navigate to active purchase. And the constraint is smart enough to be like, OK, well, the purchase is in this state, so go here. So nothing outside of it needs to know anything about all these different purchase states or nestings or whatnot. So it automatically goes to the correct subroute. And when you're inside of it, um, then you don't have to have any sort of logic for like, okay, I've changed the state, of, I've submitted the purchase or it's been canceled, now I'm gonna decide as a local component where to go. All this stuff is just handled for you automatically because you've taken the time to declare your constraints. So the result is that you get these sort of deep real-time patterns in a way that doesn't feel very ugly. And instead of this break the app and fix it, you can teach the app to fix itself, and maybe it's the wrong way of putting it. You can carefully break it, or you can you know, make it react to things as, as the data changes. That's it for me. Thank you.